Hello everyone and welcome to our new webinar series Ant Biology presented by the Translational Research Group of Calcutta University Department of Zoology and uh, in this new webinar series we actually focus not only on the new perspectives of biology but also on how biology is interconnected with various disciplines and subjects so in our saturday lectures we actually have our special series where we talk about other subjects and how biology are interconnected and in our sunday lectures like the one a very interesting one that we are going to have today we will have specific lectures on biological sciences so for our viewers you can post your comments and your questions in the chat box and we can moderate it to our speaker at the end of the session and you can also interact among yourselves and the feedback link will be provided at the end of the session in the comment box so please follow that and i am akashlina and i will be moderating today's show and without further delay i would request our mentor and convener professor nri banerji from university of calcutta department of zoology to introduce and welcome our respected speaker dr srini kaveri from insurum paris over to you ma'am thank you akashlina thank you shinjini who is at the background um, doing all the work um sending the link and uh, i think hosting and today akashlina is the face of ant biology which uh, we are very proud to begin uh, and as she rightly said uh, we um, through this webinar series uh, try to um, uh, go beyond classrooms go beyond research laboratories and bring um, uh, on this platform eminent um scientists in biology and um in non biology subjects also as she men mentioned in on the saturday lectures and we try to bring to you uh, the uh, what the latest thinkers and the movers and shakers of biology are thinking and doing in their laboratory so uh, i'm very proud and honored to present uh, our today's speaker um uh, uh, dr srini kaveri and i will read out his um, uh, short introduction to you um, uh, he is currently the director of cnrs bureau in india embassy of france uh, new delhi he is also the director of research in sam sorbonne university paris uh, he received his veterinary medicine degree in india and his phd from the pasteur institute paris Uh, he carried out his postdoctoral research training in the University of California, San Diego, USA. He joined CNRS National Center for Scientific Research in 1990, where he has been leading a research team affiliated to INSARM and the Sorbonne University, Paris. His research interests include immunopathology and immunotherapy, with a special focus on autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. From February 2015, Dr. Kaveri represents the French CNRS as the director of New Delhi Bureau at the French Embassy. And today, we shall hear from his work um, of the the last few decades, right, Srini? Um, Almost century. On, century, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> on 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 antibodies, of which he is an expert. So, a warm welcome. to you dr kaveri and a warm welcome to our speakers from around um, the the world and to future uh, the, the to future uh, participants um, uh, who will be logging in to uh, watch his uh, talk which will be archived in our youtube channel so a very warm welcome and over to you dr kaveri thank you very much ena and um, uh it's funny how these days uh thanks to the virtual meetings um on a sunday evening when you should be listening to probably robindra songeet or uh, watching a nice movie or concert you have to listen to this uh, shrini's talk but i hope you will have uh, equally you know uh, some fun time uh, let me share my screen with you Oops, sorry. I was already sharing. I guess share. Okay. Yes. 
uh, one second. Is this okay? Can you see my slides? Yes. Somebody give me a signal. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, once again, thank you very much. And today let's discuss a little bit about uh, antibodies and the therapeutic aspects of antibodies because there's so much about antibodies. And before I start, I would like to thank my colleagues and uh, students, postdocs uh, in Paris. Um, this, uh, I will be, as I go on, I'll be introducing probably the work of many of these people. This is slightly old picture, but this still gives the idea of uh, how we are and where we are. This is in the heart of Paris. What you see the building at the back is the Senate building in Jardin du Luxembourg in the heart of Paris. And uh, because of COVID, we are not allowed to sit like this these days in clusters. Um, and this is on the right side, if you go, this Pantheon, and uh, we are in the heart of Paris, actually. Um, I would also like to thank so many other colleagues who are not in the picture. And as you can see, there has been a strong Indian connection uh, in the lab. Um, and uh, for the last 30 odd years, many uh, Indians, uh, either as PhD students or postdocs, have been trained in the lab. Some of them have become even my colleagues. And once uh, you can hide the toolbar that is appearing in the bottom of your slide. What do I do that? Hide. It's yes. okay. Is it okay now? Uh, yes, sir. It's okay. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. Fine. Okay, now. Um, uh, while I thank my uh, colleagues, I would also like to thank my collaborators because. Uh, many of the questions, uh, as you will see, that I ask or that we ask in the lab are extremely clinical oriented. And uh, therefore, uh, although I'm not a clinician, I work a lot with clinicians in Paris area and uh, elsewhere. Uh, other collaborators, international collaborators are on the right side. I will be probably mentioning their work or their collaboration as I go along the talk. Uh, so I'm grateful to my students and my colleagues and my collaborators. So let's start off with a very uh, simple view of the immune system. As I was talking to Yena a few minutes ago, these days probably everybody is an immunologist, so you know all these things much better than I do. But let me take you, walk you through very quickly the way I look at it. As you're sitting, uh, even in your uh, comforts of your uh, you know homes on a Sunday evening it's quite possible that you will be uh, confronted with microbial challenges. The microbes, let's not talk about corona, okay? Corona is a different story. We will probably mention that at the end of the lecture. Uh, put the corona business on the right side, but it can be a microbe. Obviously, it is one of those, obviously. So either um, you know, a bacteria, virus, or a fungus, when it uh, attacks you or when it tries to uh, get in touch with your, you know, your system, or you wants to infect you. That happens even, you know, when you are sitting, even in your room, or we are walking around, etc. They come with these microbes. They come with what we call as danger-associated molecular patterns, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And these patterns are uh, immediately recognized by the innate immune compartment, and uh, this happens through what we call as pathogen recognizing receptors are also called tall like receptors on the sentinels of the immune system. There's a bunch of cells that are going around that pa patrol all over the body. And when they recognize that there is a danger that has come into the body, they immediately trigger the innate immune system. Innate immune system is not specific, but it is fast. It is quick. It is efficient it normally is successful in getting rid of the pathogen quite fast and without any damage or uh, which is not expensive for the body. Um, the innate immune system involves many molecules and many uh, you know, cell types of the immune system. You must have heard when you were in high school, the tears, the saliva, the mucus, et cetera, et cetera. All these are quite functional. But more important, as I mentioned to you, are the tall-like receptors. And that ensures that 
uh, immediately the pathogen is cleared off from the system without uh, it causing any damage. But there are occasions when the pathogen comes in a big load or very virulent when the innate immune system cannot cope up. What happens is these pathogens are taken by the sentinels like dendritic cells or macrophages. They are chopped into pieces and the small peptides are presented to T lymphocytes and the adaptive immune system kicks in. In the adaptive immune system, you have the peptides. Here I represent the triangle as a part of the pathogen, okay? It's a part, it's an epitope, or it is one bit, one small peptide of the pathogen. And that is uh, shown to the T lymphocytes through the T, T cell receptors in the context of class one or class two molecules. Let me repeat. Within the context of MHC class one or class two molecules, depending on the nature of the antigen, the, the peptide is presented to the T cell receptor and this triggers the immune response. This is the beginning. This is called the signal number one, but that is not sufficient. You need a lot of other molecules that we call as co-stimulatory molecules that hold the antigen presenting cell, for example, the macrophage here and the T cell close to each other in a very tight interaction. And that is important. That is called signal number two. In fact, you can completely stop the immune response if you trigger, if you target the co-stimulatory molecules. And incidentally, I'm not talking about that today. Uh, you can generate molecules or antibodies or agents that can stop this interaction. And you can, in fact, stop the immune response uh, from the ensuing steps. So once the T cells recognize the peptide or the antigen, they are activated. They are activated under the influence of certain cytokines secreted by the antigen presenting cells. And these T lymphocytes then, uh, which are naive T lymphocytes, they proliferate and they start doing what they're supposed to do. Meaning on one hand, they start secreting certain cytokines like IL-4, IL-6 that in turn trigger the B lymphocytes, which were dormant, which were sleeping. And now they become activated and they become plasma cells. And these B lymphocytes that become plasma cells they secrete antibodies and antibodies contrary to the innate immune system molecules. These antibodies are specific. Specific to what? Specific to that particular antigen that was shown by the antigen presenting cell to the T lymphocyte. So these antibodies, which are specific to the antigen will now start looking for the antigen. And imagine for the example sake, the pathogen is already in your lungs, has already reached your lungs because this takes a certain number of hours, in fact, a couple of days sometimes. And so if the pathogen has, has already reached your lungs, the antibodies, which I just now mentioned, secreted by the lymphocytes, which are specific, they recognize through the antigen combining site, the Y-shaped molecule, the arms of the Y-shape, they recognize the pathogen which are in the lungs. The moment the antigen is recognized by the uh, antibodies through the Y shape, the, another important event happens, which is the uh, macrophages, the resident macrophages, they are activated. And those macrophages express, among others, FC receptors, complement receptors, and many, many, many other types of receptors. So what happens is, when the antigen is recognized by the antibody by the combining site, the FC portion and uh, of the antibody molecule sits or engages with the FC receptors, and engaging the FC receptors triggers a series of biochemical events associated with inflammation. And this inflammation is good. This inflammation is healthy. We need this inflammation to remove the pathogen and this this is exactly the objective of the immune system now somehow get rid of the pathogen and to do so it activates the complement system and the complement system is a beautiful system which is a, a a series of biochemical events a cascade of events 
what happens ultimately is the formation of what we call as membrane attack complex, which is the one of the end stages of the complement activation. And that leads to the destruction of the microbes, the pathogen bacteria, for example, it drills the membrane attack complex actually drills a hole on the bacteria and lyses the bacteria and thereby eliminating the pathogen. And this works actually very well. It works very well. We know that because if you, if some kids that are born, unfortunately, with a deficit in any of these complement components, they cannot eliminate the pathogens as efficiently. However, now, if this pathogen is not eliminated properly, then the endothelial cells start secreting chemokines, the adhesion molecules, and some pro-inflammatory cytokines. That give a stimulus to the T lymphocytes that are naive to differentiate into various types of subtypes of uh, so polarizing to T lymphocytes. Th1 or Th2, more recently we have identified, or more recently, almost 20 years, Th17 or Trex. I'll, come, I'll talk to you a bit more uh, in detail, but what I would like to say here at this stage is either Th1 or Th17 are extremely potent and uh, the T lymphocytes that are able to re-trigger the macrophages and they further secrete some obnoxious molecules like nitric oxide or uh, metalloproteases or other cytokines like TNF alpha. Ultimately, that helps to remove the pathogen from the system. If you have excess of Th1, that can lead to an uncontrolled inflammation. So you don't want that. And therefore, the immune system has a feedback mechanism, which is very interesting. The Th2 cells that come and reciprocally regulate the Th1. Further, the Th17 cells are extremely potent and they, they are pro-inflammatory cells. And if they are not controlled, it can lead to some deleterious disasters like autoimmunity, same with Th1. And in order to prevent that, another bunch of cells, they come into picture and those are called regulatory T cells. These are CD4, CD25 and Fox P3 positive cells and they control the TH17 cells to, in order to stop the excessive inflammation. What you want to remember at this stage is all these mechanisms work to perfection and they get rid of the pathogen. And as you're sitting here, even if you encounter a small pathogen, bacterial infection or viral infection. This mechanism is working well and it works to perfection. Today, however, I'm not going to talk about all this. I know that you know most of it. You already know all about it. I'm going to focus on one particular component of this immune system and that is about antibodies. Uh, somehow antibodies, uh, I have been interested in these guys for a long, long time. My story actually starts almost uh, more than a century ago, actually, not one century, but more than a century ago, when uh, several leading bacteriologists, infectious disease specialists, and probably beginners of the immune system, because those days immunology was not a real branch of science, but we knew a lot about how the body confronts the pathogens, infectious diseases, don't forget Louis Pasteur had already happened. Edward Jenner had already happened long back. And in France, Louis Pasteur, Yersin, Emile Roux, and several leading extremely brilliant uh, doctors who were working on infectious diseases, they had identified already that uh, certain pathogens cause certain infectious diseases. At the same time, Emile Adolf von Bering in Germany along with Paul Ehrlich, they were on to something even more interesting, not only these people, but others also. They knew that in case of, for example, diphtheria, it is not just the bacteria that causes the damage, it is actually a toxin released by the pathogen which causes the damage and it is fatal, which killed many, many hundreds and thousands of people until then, thousands of kids actually. What Von Bering and Kita Sato they did was to take this, neutralize that, because by then he had identified iodoform, which you know now, iodine and iodoform, which had an antitoxin property. And using that, he injected lab animals like guinea pigs and rabbits 
and raised certain sub substance at that time we didn't know what was the substance in the serum that was able to neutralize the toxin soon they identified that actually in the serum of the animals that were injected with this antitoxin there were substances which they called in german anticorpen or antibodies and thus began a very very interesting chapter in immunology and this goes back to more than 120 years ago actually starting and bering's antibodies then became the preoccupation of not just immunologists but biochemists and clinicians they started studying every functional aspect these several years i'm going to now make a fast forward of uh, several decades of work we came to know what these antibodies are able to how they are able to function by this time we discovered complement we discovered the anaphylactic shock we discovered many functions of these antibodies at the same time biochemists were on to their structure and the binding properties the affinity avidity and other properties of these antibodies that were present in this little ampule here but in addition to these important aspects of functional and structural binding properties and genetics of these antibodies another equally important aspect was studied and that is therapeutic aspect how one could exploit these as soon as uh, as i told you a few minutes ago as soon as one bering had identified that there is a substance called antibody in the serum of the animals that were injected with the antitoxin emil roux they they showed that it works also in human beings emil roux in france had already saved 300 or 300 children who were going to die of uh, diphtheria and thanks to the production of large quantities of anti serum meaning antitoxin serum they could save the children and all these studies we started understanding a lot more about these antibodies beautiful time in immunology but i'm going to do a fast forward then came the uh, other aspect which is the therapeutic aspect and they exploited the sorry about the background noise they exploited the therapeutic aspect because they knew that there are antibodies to diphtheria the clostridium tetanus etc these doctors purified antibodies antibodies specific for certain uh, pathogens and they were keeping them in this uh, their cupboards actually and they could do the passive immunotherapy then came the bad news the bad news came in the form of world war ii when soldiers were dying not just at the battle uh, front they were dying uh, in the hospitals when they were coming back they were dying because of infections forget don't forget there was no antibiotic at that time they were dying of infections and they were dying of hemodynamic problem issues meaning they were dying because of a loss of body fluids and by then we are already in the 30s and uh, sorry in the 40s don't forget and by then we knew a lot about antibodies and it is at that time that the president of the united states of america commissioned a certain edwin con who had by then standardized the purification fractionation of every component almost every component in the plasma and they took it in a large scale thousands and thousands of gallons of blood plasma was processed and fractionated i don't know whether you have observed when you order albumin in your laboratory either from sigma or aldrich or any company next time you notice it's always called con fraction 5 con fraction 5 is the albumin but then there was other very important component but there were many other fantastic elements in the plasma and the other main component was the antibodies by now we knew how to prepare large scale industrial level of antibodies from thousands and thousands of healthy people who were donating their blood obviously the plasma 
So here we have in our hands a pool of antibodies that could save thousands of uh, patients and thousands of soldiers that were coming back from the war. And the albumin was also very useful because it could re-establish the hemodynamics and thereby stopping the, the you know, compensating the body fluid loss. It is at that time a certain, we are already in 50s, and certain uh, Ogden Bruton, who also had returned from the war, a pediatrician he was, was practicing uh, in uh, Washington area. He got a patient once whose name was Joseph Haltner Jr., who had recurrent infections, recurrent sinusitis and pneumonia, and he was not able to be treated with anything that was available at that time and by antibiotics were already there and what he suspected why is this boy not responding to any treatment what is wrong with him or what is wrong with his immune system he had the genius of trying to see is there anything missing in his uh, system so in comparison on the top panel here as you can see albumin gamma uh, alpha and other fractions there is this gamma globulin fraction and gamma globulin is the antibody fraction, a normal level of gamma globulin is there. When he compared, Bruton compared Joseph Hortner's blood sample, plasma sample, the boy did not have gamma globulins. The boy had zero gamma globulins, meaning zero antibodies. That explained his susceptibility Colonel Bruton was smart enough to say, well, if he doesn't have gamma globulins, why don't we inject gamma globulins, meaning antibodies? By then, as you remember, Khan had prepared thousands of you know, kilograms of gamma globulins or pooled antibodies. When Bruton injected Joseph Hortner intramuscularly with these gamma globulins, the boy was hale and healthy and kicking around and could go to school. Something very important has happened during this time. One, we understood that there are some children that can be born with a genetic defect, which is called A gamma globulinemia. Two, equally important is that you can treat these kids with pooled gamma globulin or pooled immunoglobulin. So a new chapter was, you know, began in immunology to treat, and these patients who were dying without being recognized properly, without being identified or diagnosed properly. Now we could save them thanks to immunoglobulins, pooled immunoglobulins. And it is at that time, they were mostly given intramuscular. Then Charles Janeway, the senior, the daddy, he, along with Beren, uh, Berenberg, they infused Janeway himself immunoglobulins that were treat with, treated with pepsin and made more soluble and injectable by intravenous route. Thus, until now, these kids who were having difficulties because of intramuscular injection, the local reaction, the painful reaction, sometimes the abscess, because the kids had to be treated almost every three to four weeks throughout their lives, a boon was uh, uh, given to them in that, you can now give in immunoglobulins by intravenous route and thereby the birth of IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin. If you have not heard or if you, if you had not heard of intravenous immunoglobulin until today, that's okay, I'll forgive you. But now onwards, you know that there is a preparation called IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin, which is actually a pool of antibodies from several thousand healthy people. When Colonel Bruton injected A gamma globulinemia patient and the patient recovered, soon others started injecting in other conditions. Just my respects to Charles Geneve, Charlie Geneve Jr., son of the senior Geneve, of course, who passed away. He was one of the pioneers of identifying the Tall Lake receptors. You must have, some of you might have read his immunology books. They're fantastic books. So here is the definition of IVIG because you will be hearing more about IVIG from now onwards. It's a therapeutic preparation 
of pooled normal polyspecific immunoglobulins derived from large number of healthy donors. Obviously, they contain antibodies to non-self or foreign antigens because they are from healthy people and healthy people are exposed to foreign antigens. Whether you want it or not, there are antibodies to self-antigens. These are called natural antibodies or natural autoantibodies. I'll talk to you about that. And there are antibodies against antibodies, which are called antideotypes. I'll mention a little bit about them in a few minutes. So soon after Bruton had identified, which is now named after him, Bruton's Egyama, globulinemia, many other antibody deficiency syndromes were identified. You might have heard about them. I'll not spend more time, but we now had a miracle treatment in that the pooled normal immunoglobulins, they were substituting for the missing antibodies. Uh, and then came the 80s. In 80s, on one cold October morning in 1982, I landed in Paris. Nobody noticed that, of course. And uh, I started working in Institut Pasteur. And these were very strange time in Pasteur Institute. And uh, um, you know, under the influence of some red liquid that the French people are very good at making this French liquid, you know, the red liquid. Scientists were sitting there every Tuesday evening. We used to call this as a idiotype club. Nothing to do with idiots, okay? Idiotype club. And uh, so we used to hear very strange things. John Stewart, who was a thinker, who was a theoretician, he claimed one, one you know, probably the influence of the red liquid, I said. Immunoglobulins did not arise in the evolution to fight infection. Well, I had not heard about that. For me, as I came from India, my education was that the antibodies import are very important in fighting infection. A certain Pierre Grabar, he went on to say, in fact, the natural antibody that, that we all have, they work as scavengers, they are cleaners, and they are transporters of the metabolic waste and dead and debris. Well, that could be, but then I thought they were more important in fighting the infection. Once again, our friend Strati Savramayas, a Greek immunologist who worked in Pasteur all his life, he said, natural antibodies are there actually to maintain your homeostasis, meaning equilibrium. Well, I didn't know what to do because I was always, you know, under the impression they were fighting infections. And then came the beautiful uh, observation of Antonio Cucini, who said, well, antibodies are much more than just fighting infection. They actually create a functional network. And that's very important. I'm lost now. I didn't know what to, what to believe, what not to believe. And then comes Irun Cohen. He said in his very uh, Israeli accent, actually natural antibodies are there as they are your immunological homunculus. Now I'm lost. I'm completely lost. Some people say they didn't fight, they didn't come, you know, they don't fight infections. Others say they are leading the scavengers. Others say, say homeostasis. I didn't even know what that means and the functional. Then immunological homunculus, meaning it's a signature of what you are. It's like an antibody fingerprint. Well, what should I do? I was there. I was, I went to France to study more about anti-infectious properties of antibody, but now I'm lost. But luckily, there was something else that was happening. This was the time when Niels Yerne was working in Pasteur Institute. And he said, there are antibodies. This is the antibody structure, heavy chain, light chain. You know this, OK? And in the heavy chain, you have some epitopes or some motifs that are called idiotopes, where the antigen binds. This is the paratope where the antigen binds, okay? And in fact, the antibody is immunogenic. If you take this antibody, inject into another antibody, another animal, you can actually make antibodies. These are anti-idiotypic antibodies that can bind here. So if there are anti-idiotypic antibodies that are specific for this region, it can actually block the antigen from binding. So these are anti-antibodies. Then you have antibodies of other, all the other kinds. Well, this was very interesting. I learned a lot about them because this, this was a, the, the really the beautiful uh, period in immunology in the 80s. We understood a lot about the 
idiotypes, antidiotypes, their importance and their role in maintaining the immune homeostasis, etc. And then I had to finish my PhD and then go to California, which was not bad. I enjoyed California. And then uh, something was very important thing was happening. See, I mentioned about idiotype as a marker or a, uh, if idiotype on this variable region of antibody molecule, we knew that it could be a marker and it could be a, and it could exploit in uh, antigenesis in, in 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 cancers. How? Think of uh, lymphoma. Okay, lymphoma is an uncontrolled uh, generation or multiplication of B lymphocytes. If the antibodies on their surface have an idiotypic marker, and if you can, these red guys here. If you can make an antibody that can bind to this surface immunoglobulin or to the idiotypes, then in fact, you can lead to the destruction of this very cell through apoptosis. This was a very interesting observation. And soon, a lot of effort was made. This was the time when uh, in the late 80s, we started working on that. and. This was the time when uh, a very important thing happened, which was uh, thanks to these observation, making a, a number of antibodies to various molecules on the surface of immunoglobulin. One fantastic molecule was born. It was being born, at least at, I was in the beginning. I was looking at the emergence of this, and this was called rituximab or anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. Monoclonal antibodies were coming you know, of age now. They were there. They were there for good. And we knew a lot about how to raise monoclonal antibodies. And this particular monoclonal antibody was not against the surface immunoglobulin, but it was against the B, uh, CD20 uh, marker. We thought that it is a simple molecule where it can bind to the CD20 and block the B lymphocyte from proliferating. But much more we learned very soon. In other words, the antibody was not only, uh, this monoclonal antibody not only was able to block the B lymphocyte from proliferating, it had impact on the monocyte macrophages, it had effect on the uh, regulatory T cells. And I'll talk about the regulatory T cells, I'll come back to that. And it can block the B lymphocytes and thereby exerting an effect on the T effector cells and on the autoreactive lymphocytes and of course on the cancerous cells. So this was fantastic. We were right there. At that point, I was at the crossroad either to go further and understand how this rituximab or monoclonal antibodies uh, could be exploited further or understood and how this immune response uh, can be modulated by uh, either rituximab or any other monoclonal antibodies because this was just the beginning. I'm talking about late 80s, don't forget. The technology was there, the technical know-how was there, the in-depth knowledge was there. The antibodies were coming in a big way, big way. And now you must have, I mean, you can, I'm sure you know about the monoclonal antibodies. They were even humanized these monoclonal antibodies were first murine monoclonals, and now we knew how to humanize them. So a new, very interesting chapter of using monoclonal antibodies in human diseases was happening. But then, as I told, I was at the crossroad. But at the same time, I knew that there is another pool of immunoglobulins called IVIG, which I described to you which had equally interesting uh, properties because we knew, we thought that these IVIG were useful for only immunodeficiencies as a substitute of the missing antibodies. But no, it is at that point I met this person. And I don't think you are looking at the right person. And I can't hear you laughing if you are laughing or smiling. Anyways, so I met Michelle. This was, I came back to France and I met Michelle Kadachki and something else happened. Paul Imbach was a pediatrician in uh, Bern in Switzerland. 
one fine morning he gets a patient uh, a boy who had an autoimmune uh, thrombocytopenia meaning the boy had auto antibodies against platelets if you have auto antibodies against platelets these auto antibodies opsonize the platelets and the platelets are taken in and they are phagocytosed and thereby the number of platelets decreases dramatically in these patients and that's why they become thrombocytopenic but curiously serendipity would want it the boy also had a hypogamma globulinemia paul whom i know very well knew what to do for hypogamma globulinemia but then this boy had this unfortunate thing on one hand he had itp at the same time hypogamma globulinemia he thought first let me save the boy from infections because he had serious infections so paul imba injects 400 mg per kg of ivig that you know to this boy to treat hypogamma globulinemia miracle happens serendipity happens within 4 5 days his platelet numbers go up to normal are you with me he was injecting paul was injecting ivig to this patient to treat hypogamma globulinemia so that at least his gamma globulin level or antibody levels are normal and that he could survive the infections at the same time his platelet numbers went up this was not expected and that began a very very interesting uh, that was the beginning of an interesting uh, chapter again in uh, immunotherapy ivig entered the clinical scenario in a very big way because soon after paul imbach showed that you can treat thrombocytopenia several other conditions were treated one after the other the entire late 80s or mid 80s to late 80s because this happened in the early 80s as you see in 1981 okay and mid 80s and late 80s we saw an explosion of the use of ivig in all these conditions i'll not go into the details but if you have questions i'll be happy in dermatology in transplantation in combination with rituximab incidentally and in rheumatic diseases a range of diseases that were treated with ivig and in neurology proven effective in guillain barre syndrome cidp multifocal motor neuropathy dermat myasthenia polymyositis and look at them the neurologists went crazy can you imagine neurologists going crazy they started treating with multiple sclerosis and encephalitis alzheimers parkinsons autism schizophrenia where are we going this is this is getting uh, out of control ivig is used as they say in india left and right but why not it was working in many conditions so they went on using without rationale and if they go on like this in 2016 it was expected to reach almost uh, you know uh, 150 tons close to 150 tons and if it goes on like this the patients who really need ivig would not get it meaning the primary immunodeficiency if you are using it to every other condition without knowing so there was a need to understand how these normal immunoglobulins or ivig works in these different conditions and whether there is a rationale for using these ivig in autoimmune diseases and other inflammatory diseases that's when i got seriously interested in immunoglobulins and as i told you immunoglobulins are two identical heavy chains two identical light chains and in the antigen combining side you have antigenic determinants that are called idiotypes you can have anti antibodies that bind and block these antibodies or neutralize these antibodies and you have afc region you have complement binding region i told you about complement a little bit earlier and the fc receptor uh, sorry the fc portion binds to the fc receptors and fc receptors are present on a range of cells like macrophages granulocytes nk cells b cells and in fact the fc receptors are very interesting uh, molecules as i told you in the very beginning if you engage a fc receptor you can either induce phagocytosis of the you know the immune complex 
or you can uh, have many other functions like a platelet aggregation or uh, in fact induction of killing by nk cells all mediated by nk cells they are expressed on many types of cells this happens because uh, i would like you to look at these motifs the rectangular motifs here one two three here here these motifs are called items or immunoreceptor tyrosine based activation motif for item but this is one particular type of fc receptor called fc gamma r2b also called cd32 that carries a different motif and that is an inhibition motif whereas if you engage fc receptors of the activating type you activate and induce inflammation beginning if you engage fc gamma uh, on the other hand, you stop the uh, stimulation, you block, and you bring in a state of anti-inflammation. This is important. Let's keep this in mind, and I'll go on. So understanding the mechanisms of action of IVIG became my obsession from that time onwards, and I'm still working on that all these years. I'm not going into the details of all the different mechanisms of how normal immunoglobulins in the form of IVIG exert an anti-inflammatory or immunomodulatory effect. I'll show you a few snapshots and share with you some more recent results which are just published or being published. So one of the first things that happened was that uh, if you have uh, antibodies that are against the FC receptors. For example, you see, these immunoglobulins, they come with the FC portion also. And this FC portion can actually saturate the FC receptors on cells. Simplest mechanism, there's nothing complicated about it. So the FC portion can block the FC receptors. And if the FC receptors are blocked by these immunoglobulins, then in ITP, they cannot phagocytose the immune complexes anymore. So we thought the simplest mechanism by which IVIG works is that they saturate the FC receptors and thereby immune complexes, including plat platelets are not phagocytosed and therefore the platelets remain in the circulation. But that was not it because soon in our group, the hospital where I was associated with, Michel Kazachkin, Yvette Sultan, Urs Nidegar, they showed that, in fact, you can use IVIG in the treatment of another condition, condition where there are autoantibodies to factor VIII. As you may remember, you may know, factor VIII is an important molecule involved in the coagulation of blood. And if you don't have a, fact, a factor VIII, you are actually hemophiliac. We are now talking about there is hemophilia, which is congenital, obviously, but then there is also hemophilia type two, which is a different type, which, wherein you have autoantibodies to factor eight. For example, here, these are the women. They don't have congenital hemophilia, but they have autoantibodies to factor eight. They were in their third trimester of pregnancy with a huge titer of autoantibodies. And Michelle Kadachkin and Yvette Sultan injected IVIG to these patients. Within five days, their autoantibody titer dramatically dropped and they went on to deliver normal babies. This opened another possible mechanism where we showed that if this on the left side is a pathogenic autoantibody, meaning this pathogenic autoantibody is able to neutralize or bind to factor eight in these patients, then IVIG contains anti-idiotypes. This was the observation. IVIG actually containing antibodies against these pathogenic autoantibodies neutralizes through the anti-idiotypes. This was a very, very interesting observation and many other people showed in other conditions. But we knew that this was not the only explanation because if you purify only the anti-idiotypes from IVIG, it was not as effective. And we then understood that in an autoimmune condition, there is more to it than just an autoantibody mediated 
uh, neutralization of the antigen. Inflammation is the hallmark of the disease. And it is at that time we started looking at different activities of IVIG, which these activities are involved in inflammation. For example, complement activation. As you may know, as I told you, when there is an excess of complement activation, there is inflammation. And an unusual cytokine network or disturbed cytokine network or a imbalance in the TH1, TH2 uh, balance. So what we showed and others also was that IVIG can actually block the formation of C4B, C3 convertase, convertase and C3A, C3B formation. More importantly, IVIG blocked or inhibited the membrane attack complex. In an autoimmune condition or in transplantation, when a tissue is transplantation, plant, transplanted, the main one of the main reasons why the tissue is destroyed is because of complement and uh, the endothelium is destroyed and many other uh, tissues in neuro neuroimmunology for example in guillain-barre syndrome in strokes the role of complement is very well established so what we showed was that ivig can actually deviate the complement from destroying the tissue this was one mechanism but soon we knew that IVIG can downregulate pro-inflammatory cytokines and upregulate anti-inflammatory cytokines in a selective manner. This opened a new chapter for us because we knew this. Now we are already in the mid 90s. By mid 90s, as you may remember, the TH1, TH2 uh, equilibrium was established, and we knew at that time, or at least for those those days, we knew that TH1 is extremely important as a pro-inflammatory uh, phenotype. And it is this TH1 that causes the inflammation in many autoimmune conditions. Whereas TH2 is a good guy here that can control the TH1. At that time, of course, many groups were using EAE, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, as a model for TH1, TH2 disease. And that's exactly what we did and what we demonstrated was that upon infusion of IVIG to these Lewis rats, we also showed them later on in mice model, you can actually have a clinical effect, beneficial effect. But more important to us was that IVIG actually reestablished the balance. It subdued the TH1, as you can see from the inflammatory profile of the inflammatory cytokine profile and upregulated the TH2, thus bringing in the beneficial effect. So we had one more mechanism. By then, uh, more uh, studies were uh, being published in the United States where they demonstrated that actually the pathogenic autoantibodies are uh, catabolized um, in an accelerated manner because the FCRN, for those people who have not heard of FCRN, it's a neonatal FC receptor, which is very important in the transplantation, sorry, in the uh, in the placenta uh, as a maternofetal barrier. And what we showed was, or sorry, these were the, this was the work of the United States scientists, you and Lennon and many other groups. They showed that actually by saturating the FCRN, uh, FCRN is important in protecting the uh, antibodies and recirculating, or in other words, in half-life, in increasing the half-life of antibodies, protecting and increasing the half-life of antibodies. But the same mechanism, if you don't have this FCRN, then they are destroyed quickly. So what IVIG does is to saturate the FCRN and thereby allowing the pathogenic autoantibodies to be destroyed by the uh, catabolism mechanism in many cell types. This was very interesting. So we had by then understood, at least some people had showed that only FC is important and FC can do the mechanism, some of the mechanisms. And this was uh, further taken to the next level by a very interesting uh, series of studies by uh, Jeff Ravage, a fantastic scientist who has established, uh, I mean, who has done major contribution in immunology, particularly on REPC receptors. He published a series of very ordinary papers, as you can see, only cell nature sciences. 
showing that IVIG works because of FC. We, until then, we were, you know, making a lot of noise saying that antibodies are important because of antidiotypes or because of TH1, TH2 complement. He said, no, forget it. You can close your shop. I'll tell you how it works. It works because FC, particularly a certain types of FC or a certain fraction of FC that carries a silylation on, on one of its uh, amino acids, uh, especially in 297 position. That is more than enough. All that you need to do is what he demonstrated is that um, IVIG works through FC mechanism and it help, It is because it upregulates through um, IL-33 and base on effect on basophils and the basophils. Now we are, we are getting uh, more other actors in uh, into the picture and IL-4 then uh, exerts its effect on macrophages where FC gamma R2B are upregulated. And if you remember FC gamma R2B, uh, also called CD32, and that switches off the inflammation. And this is the mechanism that he showed in these beautiful papers. So let me repeat. In an arthritis model, Jeff Ravitch demonstrated that on macrophages, first it binds to macrophages as induces IL-33. And IL-33 uh, acts on basophils, leading to the production of IL-4. And you know that IL-4 is also a TH2 bearing or a TH2 influencing phenotype, uh, tilting the, the balance towards TH2. But more importantly, this IL-4 leads to the upregulation of FC gamma R2B. And in the very beginning, I told you FC gamma R2B is important in switching off the inflammation. With this, several other studies more recently have come up where they are making multimers or FC, silylated or not, or hexamers or trimers, and see whether you can completely uh, you know, substitute IVIG. You don't need IVIG anymore. That's what they claim. While they were busy publishing those papers, Jagadish and many other colleagues in, in our lab, in my lab, we were interested in looking at what IVIG does to the dendritic cells because we knew, we know that dendritic cells play a key role in controlling the T polarization and T cell polarization is important in uh, controlling inflammation and autoimmunity. And the dendritic cells also have a, a regulatory role on B lymphocytes. What Jagdish demonstrated was that IVIG blocks the differentiation, maturation, and function of dendritic cells. A series of papers we published, including blood, PNS, etc. Fantastic observations where we were very satisfied that IVIG imparts a tolerogenic phenotype to dendritic cells, meaning dendritic cells that are at the crossroad between inflammation and tolerance actually are uh, subjected to a tolerogenic uh, phenotype. But what we also knew by then, we are almost uh, there, that tolerogenic dendritic cells also induce regulatory T cells. And the regulatory T cells are extremely important in controlling TH17 cells. And TH17 cells are important in inflammation. So we wanted to know what is the role or what is the effect of IVIG on regulatory T cells. I'm sure you have heard of regulatory T cells. I'll not go into the details. Very briefly, see, as a child is being born, as in its fetal stage, there are a bunch of lymphocytes that are generated in thymus. And a central tolerance mechanism is established where the cells which are FOXP3 negative, okay, if they are not recognizing the self, meaning here the um, uh, thymic epi uh, 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 thymic cells, epithelial cells, uh, they present a self antigen. If these uh, thymic cells, uh, uh, if the, t the, sorry, the T lymphocytes, they don't recognize self antigen, they are not self reactive, they go out there and exert immunity. But if they recognize the self antigen, then these cells are negatively selected, okay? Because they recognize the self and they are subjected to apoptosis and they die here. 
So you don't allow any self-reactive antibodies, but sometimes escape happens. And then these self-reactive T lymphocytes, which are FOXP3 negative, they go out there in the circulation and can cause autoimmunity. However, there is another bunch of cells which is extremely important, and they are FOXP3 positive cells. And these FOXP3 positive CD4, 25, CD4, CD25 positive cells, they recognize the self and they're positively selected and they are let out in the circulation. And these T Rex, they can control the autoimmunity. They are also called T Rex very famously. I'm sure you have heard about them. And they can control the autoimmunity in a uh, periphery. The best proof that these T lymphocytes, the regulatory T lymphocytes that express FOXP3 exist and important comes from this observation. There are some children that are born with a disease called IPEX, which is immunodysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, enteropathy, which is X-linked. The boys suffer from that. The boys that are born without FOXP3 cells, if you don't have FOXP3 cells in your system, you are bound to have many autoimmune conditions. This has been proven more than one occasion. And the one of the conditions is IPEX, where they don't have FOXP3 because there is a mutation in FOXP3 gene. And therefore, these people don't have efficient or necessary Fox regulatory T cells. The regulatory T cells, I'll not go into the details, they exert a lot of functions. They are extremely important and uh, they, are, they exert their functions by many, many ways, either through inhibitory cytokines or by cytolysis of the effector T cells. The effector meaning, in this context, inflammatory T cells. They compete, uh, the regulatory T cells compete uh, with dendritic cells and so, so they, they don't allow uh, T effectors to become effector. They cause metabolic disruption in the T effector cells, and therefore the T effectors are not allowed to become inflammatory. And they also exert an effect on dendritic cells. The very T Rex exert an effect on dendritic cells. They can block them from uh, activating the effector T cells. This we showed in a very simple paper in Cutting Edge, and that has been cited more than 500 times now. It is then Shiva who is in Kailasa Parvata, came down, a PhD student in the lab. He clearly demonstrated in a clinical setup that IVIG can actually upregulate regulatory, T regulatory cells. And uh, I'll not go into the details. It's a messy, crowded slide, but you can you know, just check out the paper so you can ask questions if you have. So we demonstrated that IVIG in the past, in the 90s, we had demonstrated that it can regulate TH1, TH2 balance. Now we showed that it can upregulate FOXP3 positive cells or the regulatory T cells and block the TH17 cells. And th this can explain the beneficial effect of IVIG in many autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. Once again, one, one more crowded slide. I'll probably not disturb you on a Sunday evening with this. But what the take home message is that when we show that IVIG can upregulate, uh, activate and expand the regulatory T cells, other groups also demonstrated that IVIG can probably also upregulate the de nouveau generation. They induce the de nouveau generation of the uh, regulatory T cells. And uh, many other groups teaching and saying same observations. But now we are trying to understand what is the molecular mechanism involved in this upregulation of T-Rex and how they exert their effect. Um, one last word about uh, autophagy because these are relatively new observations in the, in the lab. You all know about autophagy. In brief, autophagy is a system that um, is very crucial in controlling the Th1, 2, Th2 proliferation, suppression of inflammation, maintenance of immune homeostasis because it cleans up the dead and dirt and all that in the cell. And I'll not go into the details. I'm sure you have read about it. What we have recently demonstrated is that IVIG can induce autophagy as demonstrated by this marker. Um, you can check out the papers. If you have questions, I'll answer. So in brief, what I have shown you today is that in the very beginning, I showed you that antibodies are important as antimicrobial agents anti-infectious agents, 
and their, therefore their use in immunodeficiency conditions is justified. But since 1980s, we also know that IVIG is used in a large number. IVIG is natural antibodies, okay? It's used as immunoregulators in a large number of autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. So one last word about uh, corona. I'll not go into the, the pathogenesis of corona, but I'm sure you, you are all experts now. There are various ways of uh, targeting uh, corona immunotherapy uh, in coronavirus infection. Uh, first, you can target the specific inflammatory molecules because one of the major events that happens is a cytokine burst and you can stop that. You can induce NK cell therapy and you can use T-Rex and that can block, uh, sorry, T-Rex, you target them so that the effector cells become more active against the virus. Uh, or um, passive uh, immunotherapy, which is convalescent plasma, in other words, antibodies, or monoclonal antibodies, Regeneron, Trump, uh, Donald Trump got these antibodies, or hyperimmunoglobulin, which is that, you know, similar to probably not just normal immunoglobulins, but hyperimmune globulins. But then there is room for IVIG. And uh, how and why? There are some clinical studies now, there are quite a few papers on the use of IVIG. So what do we know? Very little. Four studies, but there are more others. This, this more, more and more studies are coming up, at least four clearly, uh, which have worked on IVIG. And the take-home message you can use uh, at particular window of uh, the infection. It controls the you know, inflammation, reduces hospitalization. And there are various mechanisms that is possible because we know that IVIG can suppress the cytokine burst and can block the Th1 and Th2 response, which is also important in this condition. And there are antibodies against various pathogens and therefore can prevent the secondary infections. Anyway, this is too preliminary. I don't want to go into the de details and uh, we should be careful. We can't just keep on using IVIG, uh, you know, in, uh, in an uncontrolled manner. Uh, there are very few studies. There's not con well controlled or placebo, double blind studies, etc. It's expensive and there's shortage, so we should be careful. So one last slide and I'll leave you. See, for me, this looks like a perfect evening in Kolkata where everything is fine. No, no problem. I don't want to name the problems. No problem whatsoever in Kolkata. And this is the way in I usually visualize the immune system on a perfect day when all the bad cells are controlled by the good cells, regulatory T cells, for example, all the bad cytokines, let's say TH1s are controlled by the TH2 cytokines and the pro-inflammatory cytokines, let's say are controlled by the anti-inflammatory. Everything is fine. Everything is fine until something happens. And when this happens, either because of genetic genetic background or environmental changes or reasons that we don't know, this thing, when there is a disturbance in this immune homeostasis, it starts with probably one clone or one molecule, but soon it doesn't stay uh, restricted to one clone or one cell type. Very soon, the entire architecture and the dynamics of the immune system is just disturbed, dramatically perturbed. Ideal immunotherapy for me is not suppress the immune system like cortisones. They are useful. Corticosteroids, they are useful. Immunosuppressions are necessary. But if you suppress the immune system for a long time, you will be obviously rendering the patient susceptible for other infections and other problems. And that probably is not the best solution. To me, ideal uh, immunotherapeutic agent should actually control the disturbed immune system and make the immune system come back to its normalcy. In other words, bring in those elements that are defective, bring back through, for example, a huge repertoire because IVIG contains a repertoire as big as 10 to the 16 antibody specificities, variable regions, because it is made from thousands and thousands of healthy people. And each one contains millions of different specificities. So what we believe is an ideal immunotherapy should actually re-establish the homeostasis rather than suppressing. That's what IVIG does. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank once again my colleagues. This is Shiva, Pushpa, Sebastian, uh, Justa, Justa.
Ivan, Ankit, Varni, and I mean, so I'll not bother bother with all my colleagues. And somewhere here is my bald head and judicious bald head. You need to be bald. It helps in my life. All right. Thank you very much, people. I'll re I'm ready for questions. Uh, oh, these are those elderly people who, under the influence of those red liquids, were you know, were influencing them. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful lecture. And we were all so excited. It was so informative. And we have a few questions. Sir, would you mind if we if I go through them? Yeah, yeah, please. I, I don't know whether I'll be able yes. to answer them, but at least, yeah. So our first question is from Shagor Neil Marik. He wants to know that IVIG has a crucial role in curing multiple sclerosis. Does it have any role in curing tuberous sclerosis? Um, I do not know the answer, but in fact, you should be very careful even in multiple sclerosis. These were a uh, few studies that were uh, performed in the beginning. Uh, later on, somehow uh, the results were not so satisfactory and therefore we had to stop them because you know multiple sclerosis is still a major challenge. Unfortunately, we have not found the right combination or right therapy. So uh, my, quest my answer to your question is no, we do not have a... a you know, evidence for uh, in, in any other form of multiple sclerosis. Okay. Okay, sir. So our next question is from Shaheli Vishwash, and she wants to know, can erythroblastosis vitalis, which kills the second child of Rh-negative ma mother, can be prevented through IVIG? It's a good question. It could be, it could be, but then there are more specific therapies now. There are, you know, uh, we know more about, uh, we, we know much more about the, way to handle these and therefore yes in a way you you are right it could be thought it could it makes more sense it makes it makes sense but there is more specific immunotherapies now rather than using IVH. okay yes Next. sir so sir we have uh, these two questions only because you have explained everything i guess our viewers have got everything that they want to know and uh, i have one question that sir is it possible that this IVIG can be very, I mean, we can use it in a very localized form, not okay. uh, in intravenous or in, yeah. It's a good question. It's a good question. There have been some, some application, topical application or even intranasal therapy. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, possibility. And uh, uh, in fact, there are some beautiful studies on intra uh, subcutaneous use of IVIG, not necessarily uh, answer to your question. But answer to your question, yes, there is a possibility of thinking of exerting an immunoregulatory effect through the immunoglobulins topically or locally, but this is not the most favored. But and it makes sense to think of that. However, there is a way of using IVIG subcutaneously to avoid long-term intravenous use, because intravenous means you have to go to the hospital, stay in the hospital for some time. Whereas subcutaneous, you can, you know, those immunodeficient patients, they can get their treatment in at home, you know. But an interesting question, yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your explanation. Now Good. I would like to request our mentor and convener, Professor Enaroy Banerjee, for the ending. Thank you, Akash Lina. Srini, as usual, that was such a riveting talk. And um, and yes, we were we were laughing. All those quips, which is very typical, Srini, I know. But we were all laughing, right, Akash Lina? <laughs> all those quips yeah. about uh, yeah. the, looking at the wrong person, and he put that uh, you know that attractive lady in the photograph, and then the bald head. So that was so typical, Srini. So thank and you so much. Lady, who that attractive lady was? I mean, not that I'm interested in uh, showing in talking more about it. Do you know who that is? No. No. This no. is Carla no. Bruni, the no. wife of ex-president of ah. the Republic, you know, Sarkozy, Nicola Sarkozy's wife. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. But the okay. boss is, so is Mr. Kazakhstan is the real person. Huh? He is my boss. I mean, he was my boss when he started. So interesting yeah. anecdote. So yes. thank you for an excellent lecture. And um, today being the International uh, Mother, Lang Mother Tongue Day, today mm. is the Antarjatik Bhasha Dibosh. 
And I remember many, many years back when we were going to Dokineshwar and we were asking people directions and you wanted to know what is the Bengali word for saying thanks. Do you remember, Srini? Yes, I do. Yes, so I do. I will, I yeah, will end uh, this. Yes. So Dhanubad. let us say Dhanubad to yes. all our viewers and our future viewers and um, end this wonderful evening here. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye. And to all our viewers, you can follow us in our YouTube channel as our, all our lectures are archived in it and we, for other interesting topics. And do follow us in our coming lecture, which is on, our, uh, on the 6th March, Saturday. And till then, stay safe and have a nice time.